Bienvenue à tous, bonjour. Aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir euh, comme orateur quelqu'un que la plupart d'entre vous euh, connaît bien, puisqu'il s'agit de Patrick Peter, membre de l'IAP et du groupe euh, Théorie à l'IAP, le Greco. Euh, Patrick euh, a soutenu sa thèse en 92. Il avait effectué sous la direction de Brandon Carter. Euh, sur euh, le sujet des, des cordes cosmiques. Et puis, il est parti euh, en stage postdoctoral, d'abord à Cambridge, avec euh, Stephen Hawking, euh, au DAMTP. Après deux ans, il a rejoint Denis Chiama, parce que le, les, les élèves ne lui suffisaient pas, il lui fallait le mettre, à, à Trieste. Euh, il est resté un an avant d'être recruté en 1995 au CNRS. Et puis en 1999, euh, il, il est arrivé à l'IAP. Euh, il a, après avoir traité des cordes cosmiques et plus généralement des, des photopologiques, un peu changé de thématique. Plus récemment, euh, il a travaillé sur les univers à rebond, alternative à l'inflation. Il a quand même écrit trois papiers sur l'inflation, m'a-t-il dit. Ce qui ce qui m'a surpris, <rire> et, euh, par accident. Exactement. Et, et donc récemment, il, il s'est intéressé à euh, des formulations, ou des, euh, des, oui, des, des théories un peu alternatives à la mécanique quantique standard, euh, telle qu'elle est enseignée dans la plupart des, des universités. Et donc, euh, je vais lui laisser la parole, il va s'exprimer en anglais. Euh, et donc, va nous parler du non-singular quantum universe. Patrick. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Merci. Uh, <coughs> so I was I, I wasn't sure I was supposed to speak in French or in English. So okay, I was now told I going to speak in in English. Um, okay, it's really a pleasure to uh, give a talk in this in this room. The last time I gave a seminar as the regular Friday morning IAP seminar uh, was I checked yesterday it was the 10th of March 2000. So if, I reckon that if there is some sort of periodicity, probably my next talk here will be either the 11th or the 18th of April 2036. And I therefore believe that it's quite probable that this is my last talk here. <laughs> uh, okay, so most of what I'm going to discuss, I mean, the, the, the particular results uh, which are mine, I mentioned immediately that I've done them, I've obtained them with Uh, my colleague Sandro Vitenti, who is now in, uh, in Louvain for the time being before returning to Brazil. And, okay, so I've already seen a couple of people worried that they would uh, not follow what I'm going to say, so I will, uh, the, the, I will just present the, 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 the plan of what I'm going to talk. I'm, I'm going to discuss a non-singular quantum universe, so universe means cosmology, so I will present cosmology uh, very briefly. And in a, in a mathematical way, again, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a theoretician. But and then I will move on to uh, quantum mechanics because I'm also, I also wrote the word quantum. So I will discuss quantum mechanics and the predictions of quantum mechanics and how it works in, uh, in possibly in cosmology. And then there will be, I have to apologize for that, there will be like 10 minutes, um, possibly uh, critically technical, But uh, this is just to show the structure of what I'm going to discuss. So I will discuss the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity in order to go to the notion of superspace and the Willard-Witt equation and mini superspace at the end of the day, just to show how you quantize gravity in the simplest possible way, which is not the most accepted way of doing, but I will discuss uh, why I do that. And then I will move on to the trajectory approach of quantum mechanics, which is not, as Guillaume said, an alternative formulation of uh, quantum mechanics. It's an equivalent formulation of quantum mechanics, which I will apply to, uh, to cosmology. To my mind, it's essentially the only way you can apply uh, quantum mechanics to cosmology and the full universe treated as a single system. Right, so if I have time, I will also discuss uh, an aside, which is a nice, interesting hydrodynamical um, uh, analogy to quantum mechanics, which is nice and fun, and it's also completely experimental, 
So it's just to have the people uh, saying that, yes, I can also speak about experimental things. And then I will be back to cosmology, and if I have time, I will show my own results and show how you can really forget about the singularity in a quantum universe. So let me introduce these things uh, rapidly. Again, as I said, I w I'm supposed to speak about quantum cosmology, so uh, let me just introduce cosmology just to fix the notations. Uh, so the, the, this thing is not working, of course. Yes, it is. Okay, so the, for me, quantum cosmology, uh, cosmology uh, is simply the uh, friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric, which is here, with possibly spatial curvature. And so that defines the Hubble rate as the time derivative of the scale factor, which is here. This is all very nice and simple. And in order to put that into Einstein equation, I simply need to add uh, the matter component. And the matter component, be it a, uh, a scalar field or whatever you want, it's always going to be described by t in terms of a perfect fluid which is simply, it's, it has a, a time-like vector which defines time in cosmology, and then it has an, a pressure and an energy density, and those are related through an equation of state, and the parameter, usually it's taken to be a barotropic kind of equation of state with this W being a constant. Sometimes it may also depend on the density as well, and the most usual cases are W equals zero for dust, and W equals a third for radiation domination. Um, and of course, W can be equal to minus one if you want to add an extra cosmological constant. But if you put the extra cosmological constant and you write, you put all these into the Einstein equation, you end up with the Friedman equations, which relates the square of the Hubble rate with the energy content and the curvature, and then the acceleration with the trace, <coughs> sorry, of the uh, energy momentum tensor. And so this, essentially, this is it. You know, once you do that, for the background at least, you just uh, integrate the conservation equation that gives you a very simple and closed form for the energy density as the function of the size of the universe, roughly speaking, the scale factor here. And you see you have the very simple diagram where you start the universe radiation dominated with the a to the minus four behavior, and then matter domination, and then at the end, cosmological constant domination. And the whole thing here, well, okay, you have to take into account a few details like nucleosynthesis, decoupling, and a couple of details, but apart from that, and you can find all these details in a relatively correct book written by some people around here. And so and this gives you a very nice and phenomenologically valid description for the last 14 billion years. And it's quite simple, you know, it's just two slides and this is it. It's so simple actually that, of course, it is problematic. I mean, I wouldn't be speaking about that otherwise. That if you take the scale factor, which I discussed before, and you take it now and you put whatever const content in the universe, and you go backwards in time, and that actually includes the fact that you, even if you consider uh, a phase of inflation that doesn't solve this problem, you go backward in time and eventually you will always reach a point where this scale factor goes to zero. And when it goes to zero, when you get back to the Friedman equation, you find that it's an essential singularity where the, the energy density, the energy content of the universe just blows up. So you have something which is blowing up, in a kind of a finite and actually vanishing volume. And that reminds you, if you are uh, keen on history of science, what happened at the end of the, of the 19th century where you could calculate the black body radiation, i.e. The, 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 the energy content of a northern filled with nothing but radiation at a given temperature. And the classical Maxwell theory provides the Wien's law which diverges in the ultraviolet here. And you know that this is not possible because you know that we can construct an, an oven which is not going to explode instantly. So this is not possible. And the truth is that you have to take into account quantum effect. And these quantum effects do regularize to go from the Wien's law to the Planck law. And everything is well behaved. And we know exactly how it works. Now, in cosmology, when the scale factor goes to zero, you see that what happens is that the curvature goes up in much the same way as the classical Wien case. So you feel like, well, let's quantize the thing. And then instead of having the Planck scale thing, the Planck curve, then I will go to something else and regularize everything. That's one, one reason why considering quantum mechanics in cosmology is useful. Another reason comes from various places, but including the, uh, the ceiling of the second floor here. <laughs> 
uh, that's the CMB, the CMB data, which when you analyze them, when you look at them, which I'm not going to do in details because there are many people much more uh, competent than I am for doing that, but when you analyze them, what you find is that you can reproduce all the data with a very simple um, initial spectrum, which is almost getting variant, which is Gaussian, uh, which is adiabatic, which is whatever you want. But at the end of the day, which is essentially something which is produced by quantum vacuum fluctuation of a single, single scalar degree of freedom, which of course is compatible with inflation, which is why uh, most people working in cosmology work also in inflation, contrary to myself. So, then you take, uh, oops, sorry, I made a mistake, right? Uh, then you take, you take these initial values, this initial data, and you evolve them uh, in a computer. Again, some people around here are able to do that as well. And you compare whatever you produce with the actual observational data of uh, the large scale structure, and you find something that works pretty well. So, at the background level, you can reproduce everything with a very simple theory. At the, at the perturbation level, you can reproduce everything at the, uh, in, a, in a very simple way, and everything is nice, and you see the crucial consequence here is the word quantum here. So first, you have the singularity, which you hope will be reduced or tamed by uh, quantum effects, and then the perturbations are produced by quantum things again. So, it seems that quantum effects are crucial in cosmology. Of course, though, that's the way I introduce them. You can completely forget about them if you don't want to. But, and so let me move on to, cos to quantum mechanics. And I will just summarize quantum mechanics. This is just really quantum mechanics 101. And very simply, the idea is uh, the, the, the following. The, the, the quantum mechanics, in fact, is the simplest possible you can dream of, however meaningless. And it just tells you that, well, if you don't know anything about a system, you just assume that a system is part of a state of possible systems. So you have a, it turns out mathematically that it's a Hilbert space of configuration. So you look at all possible configurations, of, and the configuration of the system you're studying is just one state of, among these, uh, of these space. And anything which you will be able to measure, technically speaking, will be mathematically a self-adjoint operator acting in this Hilbert space. You see, this is a very physical, uh, gut-based uh, kind of theory. And the measurement which you will be able to do will be only uh, of an eigenstate of any of these observable here. So when you measure something, you will be only looking at an eigenstate with the eigenvalue, right? So the evolution of your physics is you take the state here and you, you make it evolve by time simply say, stating is that the, the, um, you have a unitary evolution and therefore that implies the existence of a Hamiltonian and this state evolves simply by the fact that you want physics to be time translation invariant which implies the Schrodinger equation. So this is very, again, it's fun. Sometimes you see it as a postulate. It's not a postulate. The postulate is that you have time translation invariant. So once you have that, you also want to know what it is that you're going to measure and what it is you're measuring. I'm sorry to insist on these trivial things, but is the, the Born rule, which is telling you that the probability of observing one of these, okay, I switched notation, of course, from on the very same slide. Uh, well, I actually changed these things right now to be in agreement with the next slide, but I completely forgot that there were these things. I will change them for the later presentation. Anyway, the probability of obtaining this n value here is simply the projection of your state here over the eigenstate here, and you square that. That, that usually comes out of a, an integral. Anyway, you can calculate that, um, technically speaking. Right, so, and what happens is that as soon as you have done this measurement, the state, which was whatever, Side to begin with, right before the measurement, ends up being the actual state you are measuring, this a n here, which, or n here. So you have a collapse of the wave function, and therefore, the complete description of quantum, me quantum mechanics is that you have uh, the Schrodinger equation, which is linear by virtue of the superposition principle. It's a unitary evolution of the state. And then whenever you measure anything, uh, you see that, first of all, it's stochastic because you only can measure probabilities, and it's, of course, nonlinear because you project automatically on something which you don't know. So those two evolutions are mutually incompatible. And this is uh, very well known since uh, almost a century now, but 
Many people just don't care. And in fact, there is also an extra thing, which you find in Bohr, uh, Bohr's paper, is that you need an external observer. And remind, I, can, I want to remind you that I'm willing to work in quantum cosmology. So the external observer in cosmology is a little bit difficult to find. I mean, it depends on your ideas about that, but it's, it's not a very natural concept in cosmology. So let me remind you what you do, uh, again, when you do quantum mechanics. Again, as I say, in anything in physics, what you want is measure something. So what you measure in quantum mechanics is usually the quantum average in the state of the observable. You see, this is the O that was in the previous uh, slide. <clears throat> And so what you do, of course you cannot know anything, uh, what you do is that a quantum average you do, you repeat in the laboratory, you repeat various times your experiment, as many times as you wish, to reduce the error bar at the level you wish, and then you're, you're, what you're actually measuring is an ensemble average. And then you're saying that this is equivalent to a quantum average. And then you do the experiment and you're very happy because it actually works. It's uh, working almost as well as general relativity, so it's brilliant. Now, of course, in cosmology, you have a single experiment. It's a little bit harder to implement the ensemble average kind of thing. But when you're looking at perturbations, you're looking at various directions in the sky, and provided you're looking at things sufficiently small, you can invoke, I mean, these people around do invoke all the time, some sort of ergodicity principle by, which, by virtue of which uh, you can replace this ensemble average by a spatial average in the various directions in the sky. And then you say that, again, it is... Uh, equivalent to the quantum average. And it actually works quite well, but it's already kind of uh, puzzling, you see? But of course now this, is, this last bit is of course making sense only when I'm interested in perturbations, which are of sufficiently small size that I can measure different ensembles or different realization of these things in different directions in the sky. And now comes the little the little bit technical part of it, so I'm sorry, but I will just give a look at who is leaving the room during this bit, but it should last like five minutes or ten. Because I want to go to quantum cosmology, and if I go to quantum cosmology, I need to explain a couple of things, but don't worry, that will be quite quick. So quantum cosmology, first I need, you know, the, in the Schrodinger equation, I have a Hamiltonian, so I need a Hamiltonian version of general relativity to quantize that directly. And so the idea is that you pick a foliation of your space-time, you, you pick space, you split space between space and time, that's the 3 plus 1 notation here. So you have spatial hypersurfaces labeled by time, right? And then you have all these notations here and you have this, the, the typical metric looks like that. And, but what matters, you don't need to enter into the details of these things, but what matters is that essentially the only thing which matters here is the so-called intrinsic metric, which is the, the, way, uh, the, the, the way you measure distances in any of this uh, leaf for the foliation around here. Right. From this intrinsic metric, you have also the, the, the intrinsic curvature tensor. Now, GR is, also, is a four-dimensional theory, so you have, if you want to describe the thing in a 3 plus 1 way, you need to describe whatever is internal to these leaves, but also what is external to the leaves, i.e. the way the, 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 the surfaces, the hypersurfaces are embedded in the four-dimensional space. And that is the so-called extrinsic curvature. This is also the so-called second fundamental form. But you don't need to remember the thing. It's just, I write that just to show you that it is feasible to calculate them. In terms, and you can calculate these, the metric, the curvature comes from this thing and this, you have also the internal metric here. Right, don't worry, I'm keeping going. Now, the actual theory is GR, right? So I, I forget about the, the, the extra terms, but GR is just the einstein hilbert term, that's the action, right? Plus some matter that is going to be, that is to exist in this theory. And you write the action as the integral of a Lagrangian. Remember, I want to do a Hamiltonian formulation, right? So the Hamiltonian formulation comes from the Lagrangian formulation, and this Lagrangian here now is an integral a three-dimensional integral over whatever these things are, right? And so this is calculated in terms of the extrinsic curvature in particular and the three-dimensional curvature, everything being based on the internal metric of the foliation, right? So now that you have a Lagrangian, you can calculate the canonical momenta. Again, you don't need to know exactly how you do that, but, okay, you can define them in exactly the same way as you do in classical mechanics, right? In Hamiltonian classical mechanics. So you do this 
uh, these things. And you find, without any surprise, that in fact you have some constraint because you know that uh, gra um, general relativity is invariant under diffeomorphism, so you have to implement also these, uh, these symmetries. So anyway, so you, you calculate the momenta, and once you have the momenta, well, then you can calculate the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is the simple, usual Legendre transformation of the Lagrangian by taking all the various uh, degrees of freedom which you have here. And you can write it explicitly, I didn't write it explicitly, but then you, it involves essentially two different uh, objects, which is H and HI, which when you vary, must, must uh, vanish uh, on shell. And so the end of the, at the end of the day, you have the full general relativity. The classical description is complete by just saying that you have a Hamiltonian constraint and a momentum constraint. And that's about it, but that's all you have to know in general relativity. At least to quantize it. <laughs> and so now let's quantize it. Of course, that's the, M, uh, that's the end of the game. And as I said, to begin with, uh, if you want to quantize anything, what you need to know is the, the, the state you're working on. So the state will belong to a space, which is the relevant configuration space. Is, simply speaking, it's just whatever metric is uh, existing on your leaves. Right? So this is the space of configuration. It's a little bit more involved in that because you have to take care of the fact that you still have this diffeomorphism invariance in these leaves, but it, never mind the details. And at the end of the day, your space of configuration, which also takes into account the various possible matter fields which live in, uh, in your four-dimensional space-time, and then this is called the superspace. That has just, in parentheses, uh, nothing to do with the usual superspace of supersymmetry. It's not even related, even closely. Okay, so once you have the, uh, the superspace or the space of configuration, now to quantize, you just define a wave function normally. So in this case, it becomes a wave functional over the various degrees of freedom which you have, right? So everything is, in a way, it's straightforward. And then you apply the correspondence rule, the correspondence principle between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics by just replacing the canonical uh, momenta with the Dirac uh, canonical momenta, which are simply the derivative with respect to the variable it was working on. Just like, again, just like in quantum mechanics, it's just a little bit slightly more complicated, but not exactly more complicated, really. It's technically speaking a little bit more complicated, but in principle, it's exactly the same thing. So now that you have that, H is the first fundamental form of the, of the leaves. This is just the, the metric of, uh, of the leaf. Okay, so you apply that, and you end up with a simple thing, as you can see. Uh, a couple of equations to cons the constraint. The primary constraint just tells you that, indeed, nothing depends on this variable, but this is irrelevant. And then you, you express a couple of other things. It's just to show that the exact equations are not that complicated to write down explicitly. And then the Hamiltonian constraint, which is here. This is a little bit ugly, I reckon. And this is an operator, and this is the DeWitt metric, and this is so the so-called Wheel of DeWitt equation, which... Um, in a way, you can rewrite it in a slightly simpler way, right? It's uh, this thing. So the Willard de Witt equation, uh, of course, when you do that, you just hide all the, complex, the complexities in it. And the idea is that, in fact, it is nothing but a Schrodinger equation for a zero-energy time-independent system. Quite simple although it doesn't look like it. But still, uh, the Willard de Witt equation is just something you just can't do any calculation with. So you have to restrict attention to a simpler system, which is going to be quantum cosmology. And so you take your superspace, and lacking uh, any better word, you take a smaller place, you take a mini superspace, which is simply that you will restrict attention from the infinite dimensional configuration space, which you had to begin with, to an essentially two-dimensional space, which is much easier to handle. And and so you replace the metric on the leaves, as I said here, with the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric, which only has one single degree of freedom, which is the scale factor. And then you can also have your scalar field or your whatever matter content, which you will say only depends on time. You want to describe the background for the time being. You can also do the same thing for the perturbations. But if you do just like that for the perturbations, you end up doing something which is absolutely ugly and messy, and you cannot do much about it. Anyway, so the, the Willard-DeWitt equation, the hor horrible equation I wrote before, becomes a Schrodinger-like equation for, uh, in this space. And the Schrodinger-like equation is pretty simple to handle. I mean, we, we know how to work with the Schrodinger equation for almost a century now. So we have good techniques to do that. 
Of course, and before you raise these, uh, these questions, there are many conceptual and technical issues. One is mathematical. I, m I moved from an infinite number of degrees of freedom to a few degrees of freedom. So is, the, is this mathematically consistent? And the obvious answer is, I reckon, probably no. But I'm not a mathematician, I'm a physicist. So I'm not interested in mathematical consistency. The f interesting thing is that it works. And the second point, more annoying from the point of view of a physicist, is that I take only one degree of freedom here that actually meant, means that all the other degrees of freedom are just set to zero. And I don't even consider them momenta. So I froze the momenta with n the values of the field as well. So this is inconsistent with Heisenberg uncertainty. If I want to quantize, this is another problem. But at the end of the day, The h, i, j, depending on x, and all the various possible degrees of freedom. I mean, it is an infinite number of, uh, infinite number of degrees of freedom in, the le in each leaf. And then I will consider that each leaf only has one single degree of freedom, which is the scale factor, depending on time. So that's how I move from one to the thing. And so, OK, well, thanks. So the, the transition is that, in any case, now I can make some calculations in this case. Yeah. Because I have the scale factor and possible matter content. And this is all depending on only one parameter. So I have A and phi, which are two degrees of freedom. Let me take an example. The simplest possible example is now I consider it's, it's almost over. It's almost over for the, for the boring thing. Don't worry. So the simplest example is the perfect fluid. So the perfect fluid, as I said, this is the same thing again. And there, it turns out that there exists a formalism due to uh, Bernard Schultz in 1970, where you can write down the velocity potentials, uh, everything of, the, of your perfect fluid in terms of velocity potentials. And so you make a couple of canonical transformations. I mean, this is just technical. But at the end of the day, you find that the Hamiltonian in the willard witt equation, as I was saying, ends up being this very simple thing. So you see, this is the canonical momentum, the canonically conjugate momentum to the scale factor. This is the scale factor when you have curvature. And this is the canonically uh, conjugate momentum of the perfect fluid, in a sense. And as I was saying, in classical cosmology, the perfect fluid has, is, is, um, is on top of a time-like vector. And that actually defines time in cosmology. Here, it is exactly the same thing. There is a time, time issue here, which I'm not going to enter in. But so this, here, you see that in the Hamiltonian, the, the, the time enters linearly in a canonical momentum, which means that when you apply the correspondence principle, you move from a time-independent Willard-DeWitt Schrodinger equation into a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Time is again defined by the fluid here. So when you apply that, you put it in here. And so you end up with a time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a free particle. OK, I re redefine a couple of things. But essentially, this is the simplest possible Schrodinger equation you can dream of. And this is a, all very simple. Simple one-dimensional one dimensional theory depending on time. Fine and good. So if, if it is a very simple equation, I can write down, try and solve it in terms of a Gaussian wave packet. And I end up with this very general kind of solution. And I'm very happy. I have the, the amplitude of this thing, the phase of this object. And I have a Gaussian wave packet, and I have everything. And then, of course, I must ask the question, what am I going to do with the wave function of the universe? And this is the obvious question. What is the meaning of this thing? Because, of course, it's completely meaningless. You know that in quantum mechanics, the square of the amplitude of the wave function is telling you the probability to observe the system in this particular state. So what is the probability? I mean, I take this square and write, and so what? I, I don't know what I'm doing with that. Which is why I'm now moving on to this uh, ontological interpretation of quantum mechanics. So uh, a bit of history first. You see, the, so the, the boring part, hopefully, is over. And I'm only moving to simple and funny things now. Uh, first, historically speaking, this ontological interpretation of quantum mechanics was proposed. It's the first proposal for quantum mechanics, in fact. It was already in uh, the Broglie thesis in 1924. And it was rediscovered by David Bohm in 1952. Independently, uh, it's not clear whether this guy knew about this, this guy's work. But uh, at the end of the day, um, he rediscovered it independently. And the, this is why it's called the, 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 the Broglie-Bohm theory. 
well, some people call it the Bohm de Broglie theory, which is a little bit far fetched, to be honest, because, I mean, really, there is a 25 years difference <laughs> between them. And, and for some reason, which I will be discussing, uh, the theory was never taken on by anyone. So people just don't believe it, including uh, De Broglie and Bohm himself, which is kind of bizarre. So what happened was, the, I mean, first I think there is perhaps a sociological issue here. As you probably know, De Broglie was uh, a duke or a prince or whatever, so he, was a, he belonged to the nobility, whatever that means. And so that actually meant that uh, at the time he was having his own personal fortune, so he could do research the way he wanted without applying for anything and writing reports and asking for grants or whatever. So it was, that was a lucky time for this guy. But usually physicists don't really enjoy uh, the nobility, so that may be one reason. On the, other, on the other hand, David Bohm was actually on the other end of the spectrum. He was a communist. And in the 50s in the US, that is an American physicist who belongs to the Communist Party of the United States in 1950. And as you probably know, it was not a good idea at that time. And he actually fled the US and ended up in Brazil. And I spent some time in Brazil, which is how I got into, in contact with this theory, in fact, because nobody else worked with it. I mean, slight over exaggeration. Now, historically speaking, so everybody knows the, the, the Einstein Bohr controversy of the 1927 Solvay meeting, uh, which actually is not even in the proceeding of the meeting. So that's an interesting issue. But anyway, during this meeting, um, I mean, a third of the proceeding is dedicated to the Broglie theory, the Broglie 1924 the theory of the pilot wave. And so they discussed that a lot. And then there was this, to me again, sociologically very amazing uh, thing. Uh, at some stage, von Neumann wrote a couple of assumptions as to what it is you expect for a quantum theory to make sense. Among them, there is this so-called fifth assumption. I'm not going to enter the details of it, but the, this fifth assumption essentially rules out mathematically. I mean, again, von Neumann is one of the best mathematicians of the 20th century. So it's when he says something, it is the truth, full stop, no question asked. So because of this fifth assumption, essentially this theory was proven to be mathematically inexistent, even though it did exist. Right. And this actually, that's really bizarre, because it actually convinced even De Broglie that it, his, his own theory did not exist. Which, I, I, I mean, okay, it's a kind of a bizarre thing. Anyway, so that's, that's what happened. And eventually, nobody worked on that, you know. And, and it, it, you, you had to wait until the 60s when John Bell, I mean, he was inspired because of Bohm's paper, who reproduced the same theory in 1952. And he said, in 1952, I saw the impossible done. Because according to von Neumann's theorem, uh, this theory was not possible, yet it existed. And, you know, David Bohm, being a physicist, he didn't know anything about the theorem from von Neumann. So he did this stupid thing of actually inventing something that, is not, that did not exist. And so the... He, so Bell actually saw the impossible done. And that that's was actually the reason why John Bell started working on these inequalities and uh, these kind of things, and <clears throat> that on top of the EPR point. Now, I should mention another thing, is that usually people mention this as an ontological interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so in ontological interpretation is a phrase with two bad words out of two. Basically, when you're talking to physicists and you use the word ontological, People feel like a little bit, uh, okay, that looks like philosophy. And many people here uh, have read uh, Steven Weinberg's book, who has a chapter called Against Philosophy. So when you see, and most of the people agree with this chapter, most of them. And so ontological is already a bad word to begin with. Then there is the word interpretation. So what is the idea of interpreting a theory? You know, we have Richard Feynman told us that we must we should shut up and calculate, and don't bother about the interpretations, essentially. So these two words are really bad words, and we, this is the reason why I did not put them in the title or the summary of my talk, because otherwise I would be speaking in front of nobody. <coughs> and the very idea of giving a talk is that to have people listening to you, right? So, in fact, you must replace it by the trajectory formulation, which is what I did in, my, uh, in the summary. So instead of that, I want to discuss the trajectory formulation. Ontological is useless here, I, want, I put that in terms of trajectory, and it is not an interpretation, it is a formulation. Just like when you write uh, quantum mechanics in terms of path integral, it is exactly that, the same thing. It's just a different formulation of quantum mechanics. 
So let me write it. OK, the idea is quite simple. You take the ordinary quantum mechanics. This is pure quantum mechanics, right? You take Schrodinger equation, again, this is this one, for the special case of a massive particle in a potential, depending on the position, right? This is very, uh, you describe the, uh, the, the, the hydrogen atom with that, and you end up with the uh, ray spectrum and these kind of things like that. So even, I mean, even if you're working in, a, in looking at spectra of stars, normally you must, you must use this on an everyday, on a daily basis, basically. So you write down then the wave function in a polar form with the amplitude and the phase, as I did in the previous case. And I also, I will put on for now on h bar to 1. This is h bar, right? No, it looks like an h, but it's h bar, sorry. I put it to 1 because it's, uh, it's boring to carry it all over. And now, if I take this thing, I plug it in, and I take the, the real or the, you know, the imaginary part of the Schrodinger equation, and what I end up with is an equation which looks pretty much like the usual Hamilton Jacobi equation, except that the Hamilton Jacobi equation is just the, the part of this thing without this quantum potential term here. But this is pure quantum mechanics. I just derived it from the usual, uh, usual Schrodinger equation. I also get another equation from the real part, which is telling me that the, um, the amplitude of the wave function uh, here satisfies the continuity equation. This is the usual hydrodynamical formulation of quantum mechanics. And then comes the physics. Now, the idea coming from De Broglie, so you have the De Broglie pilot wave equation. You're saying that, OK, ontological formulation, as I was saying, ontology means there is something which exists. In particular, there is a trajectory. So I said that there exists a trajectory, and this trajectory satisfies the following equation, that MD, m velocity is just the momentum. And if you derive, actually, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the usual, uh, you go to the Landau-Lifschitz uh, book, you will find that this equation actually appears in this, uh, in this book already. And so you're saying that the, the momentum is just the gradient of the phase of the wave function. Remember uh, that uh, the, the S here is just the phase of the wave function, right? So you have this trajectory. You're saying first that there exists a trajectory, hence the word ontological, and that this trajectory satisfies this equation. And this equation is pretty us usual in classical mechanics when you think of it. So there is nothing, in fact, uh, weird in here. Or you can take this equation, derive it with respect to time. You see where I'm going to. You derive this thing with respect to time. You play around with uh, the Schrodinger equation, and you end up with the Bohmian trajectory kind of thing, uh, the Bohmian modified di dynamics. You still have a trajectory, but now the, the, the equation is, you know, the mass times the acceleration equals the force, kind of F equals MA kind of thing. Pretty simple. It's hard to do anything simpler than that. And so you have the force now is the gradient of the potential, as usual, but now you have the extra quantum potential I just described before. And so you have the classical force and the quantum force. And it feels like it's also one of the reasons why people don't like this formulation. Because people say, well, it's a little bit too classical in a way. It's, you just changed, you just added this quantum potential for the trajectories, and that's silly. They say, we want something which is really, you know, with more meat, it has to be really different from classical mechanics. But it is very different from quantum mechanics, because look at the shape of this quantum potential. It's the, 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 um, the Laplacian of the amplitude divided by the amplitude itself. So even when the amplitude goes to zero, that thing doesn't necessarily go to zero. And that's where non-locality is coming from, basically. I will discuss that in a minute. So let me come back to the uh, usual De Broglie formulation. Uh, first, because De Broglie was French, and let's be a little bit Frenchy kind of thing here, even though I'm speaking uh, <coughs> another language, but anyway. And so this is, uh, and because in any case, this equation has to be satisfied even if you consider the Bohmian dynamics. So this equation has to be satisfied. This is a constraint of the theory. So what it is, what, what are the properties of, the, of this theory? So first of all, it is absolutely equivalent to the Copenhagen version of quantum mechanics. So everybody, anyone who says you that um, the Broglie-Bohm theory is ruled out is essentially telling you that Copenhagen quantum mechanics is ruled out. And this guy is either wrong or deserves the Nobel Prize. You pick it up. Anyway, so this is strictly equivalent provided you are at the so-called quantum equilibrium. Quantum equilibrium is that the probability distribution, of course, now you have trajectories, you have particles existing. The particles exist and they have a trajectory. So now you're saying that instead of psi square being the probability to measure the particle at some stage, 
It's just the probability that the particle is at, some, at this particular point. So this is not very different, but it is actually crucial. This difference is crucial. So you're just saying that the probability distribution is just pi square. And as it turns out, this is an attractor. I mean, I can discuss that. I don't think I will have any time at all to discuss that, contrary to what I planned, but uh, anyway. So, so you actually explain the Born rule by this theory. Second, the classical limit is extremely well defined. I'm just saying that the quantum potential goes to zero. Fine, this is much better than saying that h bar goes to zero. h bar does not go to zero. First of all, I put h bar equals one to begin with, so it does not go to zero, but it's, it's meaningless. h bar does not go to zero. It's, uh, you can compare it with something, and this something is in fact the quantum potential going to zero compared to the classical potential, for instance. And you see immediately that in vacuum, for instance, where you don't have a classical potential, quantum effects can be always very important, because even if the quantum potential is small, small is always much larger than zero. So you have quantum effects even in vacuum. Next is that, of course, the thing is, well, is depending on state, but that's usual quantum mechanics. And why is this thing not killing? Okay, there exists an intrinsic reality, hence the bad word ontology. And this intrinsic reality is clearly non-local, which is fine. We all know that quantum mechanics is non-local anyway. We don't, we don't have any problem with that. And, of course, well, that's the whole point of getting there, is that there is no need for an external domain, an external classical observer, which is fine, because I don't want a classical observer. I can't resist um, showing this quote, because, which is, by, which is the question of the Murray man said that Bohr brainwashed a whole generation of physicists into thinking that the job was done 50 years ago. And he was saying, he was referring to the measurement problem in, class, in quantum mechanics. And I think, of course, he was wrong, in a sense, in Murray's Gehrman's idea, Born was actually wrong in telling you that, because indeed quantum mechanics does have um, uh, a measurement problem. But in fact, he was right when you take into account this trajectory approach to quantum mechanics, because indeed it was like 50 years ago, at the time where he was saying it, that this theory solves the measurement problem. That's a funny thing, just an aside. Now, the, the, the real test, now, if you, you pick up Feynman's uh, book, and you find that he was speaking about the two-slit experiment, and he said that it is a phenomenon which is impossible, and he insists, absolutely impossible, to explain in any classical way, and which, is, which has in it the art of quantum mechanics. So that's what Richard Feynman said, and he refers to the Young experiment, when you have light or wave or whatever, producing an interference pattern. And of course, the actual idea is that when you have an electron uh, beam, uh, over a screen and you find that you have these dots here, you project the electron one after the other, but you recover at the end, even though you're throwing the electron gun one by one, you end up with an interference pattern and this is indeed impossible, absolutely impossible to understand in any classical way. So now if by classical he meant in terms of trajectories, then this, is, this sentence is factually wrong. Because when you do the calculation of these uh, trajectories, this is what you see. And when you put a screen here, the density will, uh, will reproduce exactly, uh, you see, the big the interference pattern which you measure. So, a few points uh, at this stage. First, some people have called these uh, kind of trajectories surrealistic. Not exactly in this context, it's, a, it's in a different context which I could uh, discuss, but the idea, roughly speaking, uh, it, it is, it amounts to saying at some stage that these trajectories are non-straight in vacuum, even though this is not exactly the idea. They, they can have effects, they can have bizarre effects, even though they are not, so there seems to be real, unreal, unrealistic or surrealistic. And the idea is that, of course, if you are in, a, in vacuum, well, the classical potential is vanishing, but the quantum potential is non-vanishing. And in fact, when you're saying that the trajectory is bizarre, is, that, is it simply because you're forgetting about the quantum potential? And the quantum potential is crucial to explain everything. Uh, there is a more recent. There are more recent calculations, and if you don't, um, if you don't think uh, that this is of any relevance, uh, since like the past ten years, some people have found a way to do weak measurements. So by weak measurements, what is said is that essentially people measure things in a very weak way, so that the trajectories or whatever trajectories you might have, so that the the, the, the disturbance of the state is very small. And they repeat experiment many times so that they can reconstruct 
what they call quantum trajectories. These are not these trajectories. In principle, these are not these trajectories. But you can compare them. This is what they reconstructed. This is an actual experiment with the reference and things. You can check it up. This is the average trajectories of single photons experiment using weak measurements. And you see exactly what, what it is you recover, and these are, and you compare with that. So again, if Feynman was saying that it is uh, in a, that classical way meant in terms of trajectories, then he should be unpleased about this kind of uh, result. Of course, trajectory is not the whole thing, as I was saying, because indeed these trajectories, uh, however you can call them surrealistic, is because you also have to take into account the wave function. In the uh, trajectory approach, it's ontological in the sense that the trajectory and the wave functions do exist. Right. So, yes, in fact, he's right. It's impossible to explain in any classical way you need a quantum trajectory to do that. And, in fact, another point is that uh, Richard Feynman, it, when you Google him, you will find it's almost impossible to find he, a picture of him with him not smiling. I mean, it took me like half an hour to find a picture like that. Usually he's always smiling and happy and anyway. And then I wanted to move to something else. I, I'm sorry, I will have to switch because, okay, there have been some technical problems. So let me switch to that. Let me do an aside very, very quickly. I want to show you a classical thing. I want, I want be Rich Feynman to be really unhappy. And so there, was, there is this experiment, which was done like 10 years ago, less than that. Yeah, 2006, basically, which is the following. You have a shaker and you have a silicon oil bath where you put a droplet of the same silicon oil on top of it. And you make it shake. And because it shakes, you can excite a so-called Faraday wave, which is a standing, wave, standing surface wave. You can excite it. And in fact, you put yourself, sorry, just below the Faraday wave threshold, so you do not excite the wave, in, in fact. But the thing is moving like that, up and down. And then you put the droplet on top of it. Right? And the droplet has a <coughs> surface tension which is sufficiently high that when it uh, bounces of, the, of, the, the, of the, the, the surface here, it can bounce almost an infinite number of times. And so you have an experimental setup. I told you I will show an experimental setup. You, this is the experimental setup. And you can measure it from the top or from the side. Right? And just to be honest, here are a few all the numbers, I'm not used to doing that, but uh, here are actual numbers of an actual experiment taking place. You know, real measurements, hardcore things. And so here is the typical kind of thing. So you have a, dro a droplet and the thing is moving and the droplet is just going up and down, right? And you can also, oops, shut up. So uh, you can also do that with many droplets, two, three, whatever. I mean, you can do complicated things. I'm not going to. Keep going on that. And now, when you, you can modulate the, uh, the motion, i.e. you can, if you, um, you play a, a, bit, a bit with the frequency and then you start seeing that this thing, when it goes down, you know, when it, when it reaches the surface, it creates a wave. But if you move the shaker in a slightly different way, out of tune somehow, then when the, the, the droplet is going to go down again, then it will not be at the trough of the, of the initial um, wave pattern, but somewhere along, and it will have a phase. And this phase will actually push the droplet around. And you see, it will start, it becomes, a, from the droplet, it becomes a so-called walker, because it's walking on a, it's kind of Jesus-like, right? It's walking on the surface of water. And now you, uh, you, you take one image per bounce that actually suppresses the vertical motion, and so you find the horizontal mode only. And so this thing, you see where I'm going to, right? So you have a wave here, and the wave is actually pushing the droplet as if it was a particle moving on top of the wave, of the, of the wave function. And now you look at the trajectory of this thing, and you see you have uh, this... Uh, this water here, the, the silicon oil, and you see the trajectory is kind of weird. It's really bizarre. It's completely random in principle. It looks like random. Of course, it is random because you, have, you are not able to measure everything with the right accuracy to know exactly where this thing is going to. In principle, if you add everything, this is purely classical hydrodynamics, if you add all the data, in principle, you should be able to reproduce these data in principle. Just like when you throw a dice, in principle, if you knew everything, you would know exactly what is going to be uh, the, the, the number at the end. But it's, in practice, it's not possible. So you do that, and you see that these, 
weird kind of trajectories. And then you move on to uh, seeing from top. And you put a color code by, with, which takes into account the velocity so that what you're actually doing here is producing a probability pattern, right? And when you accumulate with time, what you find is that, you see, you have different, uh, you can reproduce the probability in time of measuring your particle here or there, right? And then, so you produce, uh, come on, you produce at the end the probability distribution function, right? Funnily, so, okay, this is just the same thing with, uh, with images, and so here is the probability distribution function again, and then you compare with something, and what is this something in particular? Well, the Faraday wave. You haven't excited the Faraday wave, you're just below the threshold, as I said, so you don't have the Faraday wave, but then what you reproduce really, you can see this is the Faraday wave, and these are the data, sorry, you see, yeah. and so, so you do reproduce the same thing. So this is a really fun, it's a purely classical system. Now move on. You can also uh, form quantized bound states. So it's, uh, you are really in the same kind of framework and they are really quantized, really. It's, uh, it's really fun. And then, uh, if you put something in a, in a bath, in a silicon bath, then this something will act as a barrier. And so, of course, you can put a barrier here and a slit in it, or two slits in it, and try and do something like the two-slit experiment with something which is a wave and a particle on top of it. And this has been done. It is so interesting that it even uh, appeared in, uh, in an episode of Through the Born Wall presented by Morgan Freeman some time ago. And you see, look at the trajectories of these things. They're kind of they're really weird. These are actual trajectories. And you see the, the, the effect of the wave is to do some kind of bizarre thing. A couple of snapshots, you see it arrives here, it goes there, there, and there, whatever. Pick a few of these trajectories. You see here, they are essentially coming from the same point, but one of them is doing this weird thing, the other one is doing this other weird thing, and it just go in any place. It's not the same thing as a Bohmian trajectory, of course, because Bohmian trajectories just can't cross normally. But, and you see, it can be a little bit messy when you accumulate uh, many, many of these. But just like in the previous case, you accumulate all these trajectories, and you end up with a probability distribution function, which is exactly the, 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 the Faraday pattern, the Faraday wave. Now you do that, and it's apparently random as well. And then, of course, you want to reproduce. You look at what you end up with at the other end of the thing, and what you find is this particular distribution. You see, if the thing was really classical, you would have just this, this shape, and you don't have this shape. You have really this, the two-slit experiment. And now, uh, so here is the reference for those interested, and now Feynman is really unhappy because it's a purely classical system. Now, uh, eventually, I will go back to, go to what I'm supposed to present from the beginning. And so as I said, well, okay, I have my wave function with the phase and thing, and I have a Gaussian wave packet, I'm very happy, and the question was, what am I doing with the wave function of the universe? Well, I can apply now the De Bruyne-Bohm trajectory. Remember that this x here is essentially the scale factor, and so I can solve the De Bruyne equation, and I find this thing. So explicitly, though that was done kind of 20 years ago, and you can find that you have a bouncing cosmology. Basically, the scale factor goes, decreases, and then you find that the quantum potential becomes important here. You have a barrier which, of, which makes the scale factor avoiding the singularity, right? So it bounces off like that. It can do that even when you have negative spatial curvature. So you're just uh, forgetting about this problem with bouncing cosmologies and, uh, you know, uh, violating the null energy condition kind of things. And anyway. Of course, for positive curvature, you can find even solutions with many bounces, right? So, that's the first thing. First, you solve naturally the, uh, the singularity problem. Let's do that. Okay, so we d what we did uh, with uh, Sandro Vitenti, I don't want you to enter into any details of this, but at some stage, I'm supposed to show also what, uh, what I'm currently doing. And so what we did is just a slightly more involved thing. And instead of having uh, the, the simple uh, states, simple Gaussian state, uh, we started with an initial almost Gaussian with a power law on top of that, almost Gaussian, with an initial um, value for the, for the Hubble scale. 
And so we could calculate the propagator and we end up with a propagator. So first we did that in a completely analytical way and we extended it also to Bianchi universes and it's uh, getting interesting at this stage. And so here is the initial wave function for various parameters of the wave function and it is the time evolution. Eta now is the conformal time we're working in terms of um, radiation field. And you see the wave function evolves now in a bizarre kind of way. And now I take the trajectories, and you see you start with the same trajectory with different value of the initial scale factor, um, Hubble rate, and you find that essentially you always have a bounce again, again, again. And sometimes the bounce is non-symmetrical, and sometimes you even have two bounces. And in fact, you can have more than that if you want. I mean, basically, you see this is, I mean, this was the very simple first case 20 years ago. This is what you have when you actually study the whole thing. Now, um, another, Another way to do it is to do it numerically instead of solving uh, this analytically. So we did that uh, numerically and you see, so here is the initial wave function we start up with in a, in a potential, there is a potential in this particular case uh, in order to compare with different formulations. But so we have the wave function. This is the real part. This is the imaginary part of maybe it's the opposite. I don't remember. And this is the phase. Remember that the, the equation is that the, the momentum is proportional to the gradient of the phase. So we need, so this is the gradient of the phase initially. And then, and all these points here are initial values for uh, the scale factor. And these are, they are going to follow the equation of the, the, the Broglie equation, right? And this is the, uh, the, the red dot here shows the, the average value of the scale factor in this particular thing. And actually these points are also the points when you, you, can, you can solve this thing again, it's another thing which is not usually said, is that in quantum mechanics when you want to solve the Schrodinger equation numerically, of course, uh, very often it's going to spread all over the place and it's going to be complicated. So even though it's linear, what you want to do, you want to do that with an adaptive mesh method. And the adaptive mesh, which you're going to construct, is actually based on these points, the, 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 the quantum trajectory. If you take on the strong quantum, quantum trajectory, the Bohmian tra quantum trajectories, then you will have the most suited adaptive mesh for this system. That's again an interesting thing. So let it evolve. And so you see the wave function starts behaving uh, in bizarre ways, which are depending on the, on the parameters which we put in. And so some, these, these are the trajectories and some are decreasing. Don't worry, they won't go all the way, of course, to the singularity. They will eventually bounce off and some bounce originally. And you see the mean value is, uh, is interesting, but contrary to the, simple case, the simplest first case that was studied like 20 years ago, the mean value was the same shape. You see, this, is, this shape in the simple case <coughs> was uh, just like in the supernova uh, light curve. You have to stretch and change it, and essentially you end up with the same curve. In this case, this is not, this is not true. You have various different uh, kind of trajectories. So the, the actual trajectory you're on is meaningful. So this is defined by a couple of parameters. I can show another uh, example. Uh, sorry, it should start again. And so here we go. The wave function evolves in a bizarre way. And you see, you even start with something which is going up, something which is going down. And these two trajectories, if you look at perturbations on top of that, and of course, I won't have time to do that. I suppose, uh, yeah. Well, we'll need uh, like an extra 45 minutes. It's fine. Nope. <laughs> Well, that was the plan originally, sorry. So you see, but I mean, what I was saying is that if you are living on this trajectory or if you are living on this trajectory, you have different effect. You have a different cosmology at the end. And okay, so this, uh, I, will, I will stop with that then. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs> okay. Some questions, so. What happens when you perturbate this uh, basic solution? <laughs> Good. Now I move on to the, the second part of my talk. And <laughs> well, the thing is that we're doing perturbation on top of that. Uh, usually what you do when you do perturbation theory, you have, uh, you have chalk here. Yeah. So what you do when you, usually you start with the action, you see, which is, uh, the einstein hilbert action plus, plus the field or whatever. And then you expand that in terms of uh, the background term plus the second order term plus something, right? 
And so this gives you the background. And normally, what you take is you describe this in a classical way for the background, and then you quantize that part. And so you're essentially adding potatoes and bananas, which is not always a good idea. So what we do, I mean, the way to do it now is that we don't have this formulation. We write down a Hamiltonian formulation. So we write the full Hamiltonian as the zero order Hamiltonian, which is that thing, I mean, which is what is taking place here, plus we expand the whole thing. This is the same thing as, as here. We expand the whole thing up to second order as well, plus so on and so forth. And then we say that the wave function, the full wave function, is going to be the wave function depending on the scale factor, and as I said, on time, right, times a wave function of the second order, which is A, and whatever you want to call that, like the Mukana variable, the perturbation, the tensor perturbation, whatever, you see, and time. And so when you do that, that's uh, Halliwell Hawking papers, basically 1985, you do that, and you're very unhappy because you don't do it, you can't do anything else. Basically, you're just screwed. There's nothing else less you can do from that. Now, what we do is that, so we solve that part, you know, h0 psi 0 equals whatever, 0 essentially. And then from this point, so we have psi 0. From psi 0, it has a phase. From the phase, I end up with an equation, a dot equals the gradient of the phase at the zero order. And I solve this equation that gives me a scale factor depending on time. And now I plug it back in here. And now I can take this bit and I have h2 psi at the second order of my perturbation equals zero. But I have now the scale factor here, which is the quantum scale factor, which is why I'm saying if I take any of these trajectory, Clearly, it's going to be different on this one and on this one. And so I can reconstruct even knowing the full thing. But you see, that's the point in quantum mechanics. Usually, people tend to forget that in quantum mechanics, you need to know the whole state. And now, in this particular case, the trajectory. So applying this perturbation theory is, you know, involves linearity assumptions. But one big problem with, in general with the bouncing universe is that shear effects, etc., will diverge dramatically. And that oh. will make it very, very, will that not make it very difficult to arrange the bounce? Which is the reason why we're trying to do the same thing with the Bianchi universe. We want to calculate this, the effect of the shear in, in exactly. That's exactly what we, what we want to do. And it, there are some technical issues uh, in doing that, because in particular, it's complicated to, um, to find the Hilbert space, uh, which is, I mean, there are some technicalities here, but indeed, we want to do that using uh, a Hilbert space. And the, the idea is that um, the, the trajectories will be trajectories of, uh, of the shear as well. Of course, we will have three scale factors in this particular case, in the Bianchi case, for instance. And so we will have three different re regime where we have bounces. And the question is, what is the typical wave function, which is such that, indeed, your, uh, the, 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 the BKL instability, for instance, just does not take place, or is essentially temable, I would say. And, but that's exactly what we're doing now. And then on top of that, we need to calculate the perturbations and make sure that they are um, statistically uh, homogeneous because we don't want uh, isotropic, sorry, uh, because we don't want the anisotropy to, 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 to be seen in the data. I mean, at least as far as I know. Yes, I have two questions. Why is it OK first to neglect the ultraviolet effects when you go to, when you which, go to the bounce? Which effect I mean neglecting? The ultraviolet, of, uh, the curvature effects. Your curvature blows up when you go to, and you're quantizing the infrared, uh, yeah. GR in the infrared. Yeah. Uh, in, in this particular case, okay, we took the case where the curvature is, I mean, the spatial curvature you meant. No, I meant the fact that GR uh, should be corrected in the ultraviolet. And yeah, that's what we do. No, but you, you start with, from the Hamiltonian of GR. Yeah. So you should start from the Hamiltonian of GR plus ultraviolet corrections, I suppose. Because well, GR these is are ultraviolet. No, 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 no. I, we have quantized GR. So it is not GR anymore. It's just like if you do uh, QED, 
you don't have the Venn curve at the end, you have the Planck curve in principle. Technically, it's complicated to reproduce, but by quantizing the Maxwell field, you end up with the Planck law. So what we do is we quantize the Einstein field, a la Willard de Witt, mm -hmm. and then what we find So you get naturally the Planck mass in your, in your equation, so quantum effects yeah, from absolutely. GR will appear at the Planck yeah, scale. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Sorry, there is the Planck mass all over the place, yes. Okay. So the other question is how does, uh, in this interpretation of quantum mechanics, how does the transition from quantum to classical happen? This is related to the question I just asked. So is it at the Planck scale? Is, is there another term on the right-hand side of F equals MA? So this depends on the wave function. Just like you can have uh, collective effects in usual quantum mechanics, like when you take a <coughs> Uh, when you take a uh, Bose-Einstein condensate or um, a superfluid object, you have loads of uh, collective effects which can also be uh, existing uh, quantum mechanical effects on very large scale, much larger than, say, the Compton wavelengths of whatever particles is considered. So in the same th case here, it all depends on the wave function. This is something which people, again, tend to forget in quantum mechanics, that the wave, sta the wave function, the state you're considering, is crucial. And you see, I mean, the, these two, the, these evolution and the previous one are basically uh, showing the same physics with a different quantum state. So if you start with a state which has numbers in it, which are big or small, you can end up with completely different typical uh, time scales or wavelengths or whatever. So the, it, all, it all depends on the state. So you don't, in a way, you put the problem <laughs> under the rug. I agree with that. But... <clears throat> It is depending on the state itself, and we don't know what the state of the universe is. So we have to play with these states and figure out what they are. So the best thing we can hope for is to uh, build a, a quantum state, find the trajectory, find the, the, the perturbations on top of that, and reproduce the, the, the whole thing and reconstruct the state. We can only inverse engineering these kind of things, unfortunately, because we don't have, at this point, a theory of initial data, which is what is missing but at least we don't have the singularity. So, probably a naive question, but um, is those, those states uh, sort of can be linked to the content of the universe? To the what, sorry? I to didn't the content of the universe? Ah, of course, yes. So, what does it tell you on, on the content, like uh, compared to our standard uh, picture of lambda CDM? Okay, at this stage, uh, it's, uh, it's not telling you much because uh, we need to, you need to solve this willard the wit equation. First, you need to impose symmetries like, uh, is it going to be um, <coughs> Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker, or Bianchi, or whatever, as I was uh, saying to Joe. <coughs> and then you have the matter content. If you have more than one fluid at any instant of time, like the transition, for instance, it's not something we are, um, we are able to do for the time being. The reason is the following. We take... Uh, let me erase this. Right now, we, um, so anyone having an idea on that topic is, uh, is welcome to discuss with us. As I was saying, in the, in the Hamiltonian, so we have the usual uh, general relativity Hamiltonian, plus we have something which is the momentum of, uh, associated with the fluid. And this, when I will quantize that, that will give me like d by dt. This is for one fluid. But of course, if I have various fluids, I will have the same thing, the same formulation. The Schutz formulation will give me the same thing. And so I will have that, minus r dt r1, d by dt2, so on and so forth. And this, technically, I will have many times in the same thing. So it's not in the same object. So cosmology will be kind of weird. And by the way, by doing that, I'm almost uh, certain that if I, even if I start with an absolutely uh, Friedman universe, because of this effect, this will create a, a space-like vector, which will be the, the, the difference between these two time-like vectors, and that will sort of create some shear at the transition. So I expect to create some shear at the transition. That's the first point. The second point is that we don't really need to do that, actually, because uh, we know that the, the universe is quite classical now. 
And so what we really do is we, we take only one fluid, like say radiation, which is why we do all, everything with radiation, because we expect that if quantum corrections are, any of, are, are of any relevance at any time, that will be when the universe is very small and very quantum-like. I mean, it can be quantum-like only if the energy is almost Planck-like. And therefore, we have only one time, and then we start, so we do that, we have the wave function from which we can infer the quantum potential. And this quantum potential, we can write down equivalent equation to, uh, to the Friedman equation. And so we have the term, the usual Friedman term, plus a quantum correction. And almost instantaneously, right after these bounds, what you find is that this thing becomes completely negligible to uh, any other terms which you might have. Sorry, this H is, uh, I mean, the Friedman F. Sorry. You see, with the Hubble scale, basically. So this becomes very rapidly completely negligible, and therefore you, you, you have the very naturally a, a transition from the purely quantum to the purely classical, which is why we don't do it. But theoretically, we should do it. Just uh, two short comments. Um, you showed that uh, you obtained uh, hamilton jacobi equation of the passes uh, from Schrodinger equation. Therefore, my conclusion is that everything that you are uh, explaining can be somehow uh, have an analog in the usual uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Absolutely. Therefore, therefore there, is, there is no difference really between two formulation and no new, I mean, aspect as, as you mentioned, for instance, for uh, no, uh, no need for an out, uh, outside classical observer. And this brings me to, to my second comment, uh, because uh, this uh, concept of um, uh, um, uh, Copenhagen uh, uh, interpretation is now replaced, as you uh, surely know, by decoherence. And as we are in conceptually uh, living in an open universe, uh, therefore we have always, uh, we can always consider some part of the universe as a background uh, which plays the, uh, the, the, the role of environment for the decoherence. Therefore, the problem is really does not uh, come into question. Okay, uh, so I disagree with, I think, basically both of your statements. <laughs> um, first of all, yes, I think this trajectory approach uh, brings something different. Uh, it's, it is indeed, in most uh, known cases, essentially the same thing. And there is no prediction of the De Broglie-Bohm uh, theory, which is not done by classic ordinary quantum mechanics in, uh, in the usual view of it. This is absolutely true. But, for instance, we need the, in, uh, in the quantum mechanics, we need the Bohm rule. And in here, we don't need the Bohm rule. So we explain the Bohm rule by means of trajectories of particles. So it is weird to have trajectories of particles. I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't actually know why it is weird to have trajectories, but it has been... I mean, we have been brainwashed into thinking that there is no such thing as a trajectory in quantum mechanics. But if you start with trajectories and you look at whatever, what actually happens with this trajectory, you have chaotic mixing and all these kind of things. This was the second part of my talk I didn't have time to discuss. And you find that you can recover the Bohm rule. So you don't have to put the Bohm rule by hand. So to me, it's, but it's a different issue, of course. You don't have the Bohm rule, but you have trajectories. That's the first point. The second point is, so therefore there is something it's equivalent, but it's uh, not exactly the same, the same level. And the second, uh, the second point was, uh, what was it you say? You're saying that, okay, decoherence. Decoherence does not solve the, 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 the measurement problem. Decoherence helps you to understand why, is it, why it is that when you're doing a measurement, you will, because thanks to the environment indeed, you will measure an eigenvalue of this thing. But it's not telling you, I mean, when you have only, this is again, very useful in order to understand your uh, experiment when you repeat the experiment. But I'm again in quantum cosmology with only one universe and I don't repeat the experiment. So I have many possible values, say, of the scale factor or whatever, but why would I have one particular one? And why would it have this particular time-like evolution, time evolution? And this is not in the original formulation of quantum mechanics because uh, either you take, um, I mean, you really need to implement 
something in order to explain an actual experiment, you need to implement something on top of the Copenhagen interpretation. So you, even the coherence is not enough, and what you need to uh, put on top of that is either a many-world view of quantum mechanics or, uh, or this, or you, you need to do something extra. So we do this extra. You can take the many world. The thing with the many world is that in principle what you can show is that you will never be able to prove it right. So from my point, or wrong, basically. So from a Popperian point of view, I think this is not physics. But, uh, oh. and, okay. <laughs> okay, there is a very last question. <laughs> okay, um, so a question also about De Broglie bomb. Um, so I was always puzzled by what uh, Feynman said. I mean, the simple way to understand two slit classically is to say electrons are fundamentally waves and the quantum mechanics just happens in the detector, right? That's where the stochasticity is, right? The thing that really destroys a, a classical picture is not two slit interference, it's two photon interference. It's Hilary Mandel's experiment that showed when you have these nonlinear crystals, the two entangled photons mm -hmm. produce fringes, but those fringes are not in space. They are a function of the separation of two detectors. Yep. To my mind, that's what completely destroys the idea of objective reality. It's what, you know, it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, just to think about it. So, and how can that be compatible with de Broglie bomb, which does have objective reality, is okay. my question. So in fact, what you're uh, um, pushing in front is basically the, the, the EPR argument. That's entanglement, the problem. And entanglement, I mean, the EPR, I mean, Einstein himself, of course, was the first to say that there is something weird in that. But if you remember this uh, brilliant paper, I think it's one of the most uh, spectacular paper written in, uh, in physics, very simple and clear and neat, and then the conclusion is just astounding. Uh, you, remember, you will remember that there are many options, and one of them is indeed that there is no objective reality. True. But another one is physics is non-local. And Einstein would say that physics must be local, so he will dis discard completely this possibility. And what is done here is that we discard the possibility of, uh, of I mean, we, we, we keep the theory to be to, to have an objective reality in it, it's, so it's called ontological, but we don't have uh, locality. And indeed, um, you, because what people tend to forget is that when you have the trajectory, the trajectory is not the whole thing. You have the trajectory and the quantum potential, or I mean, the wave function. So the wave function is also ontological in a way. So because the wave function exists, you cannot say that, oh, the particle is here and therefore nothing must appear there. No way, the wave function is everywhere. So that's why these trajectories are not surrealistic in a sense, because you have to take into account these non-local interactions due to the quantum potential. Now, that's how, and you see, that's, that's why you actually solve the measurement point as well, is that when you're doing an experiment, you never actually collapse the wave function. The wave function remains what it is. It's just that because you have measured the particle here, I mean, you know that the particle is here. I mean, it's a pre-existing quantity. The particle was here and there and was traveling around. So you measured it here, but the wave function remains all over the place, except that the wave function is now empty. So you have a whole part of the wave function which is empty, and it has uh, no overlap with the detector's wave function. So therefore, effectively and dynamically, these parts, right after the interaction in the von Neumann um, regression, right after the interaction, this, the extra part of the wave function, which is empty, is not going to interact anymore with that of the detector, and therefore, it's, for, for all practical purposes, it's vanishing. You can put it to zero, but it is non-zero. But the fact is that the, then the trajectory keeps going, and you're still working. So you solve everything, and it is, again, non-local. I mean, there are various experiments to show that, and showing also that these trajectories... The trajectory is not the whole thing. And again, finally, just to <laughs> conclude on that, if you have a trajectory, uh, usually people have in mind that if you have a trajectory, you will be able to write down the electric current in terms of, you know, you will write the current as of a delta of x minus x of t, right? This is not true. The current is the gradient of the wave. You know, it's, it's an actual... We know that the electromagnetic current is essentially like, okay, there's a minus i, I think, but that's psi, d psi, like that. This is the electric current.
I mean, there is a charge as well on top of that, of course. So the electric current is actually given by the current of the wave function. So the fact that the particle is behaving in whatever ways it wants, if the wave function is important in here, you will have an electromagnetic effect here, even though the particle is there, because the electric current is carried by the wave function, not by the particle, in a way. Okay, I, I should stop here. Sorry about that. I think, I think you should stop. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your talk. And thank you.